Hi, I'm Danielle Peterson from Infrastructure News. Today with us we have Johan van Weyck. He is the director of the Southern African Ready Mix Association and we'll be discussing concrete and specifically ready mix concrete. This is CPD On Demand. Johan, thanks so much for joining us. Um, let's start off with ready mix. Tell us what is it, what are the advantages of it? Danielle, generally ready mix, uh, if you evaluate whether it is ready mix, there are two rules to look at. Ready mix is manufactured in a plant mm -hmm. and then transported to a site in a ready mix truck. The second rule would be that generally the user of the ready mix is different from the manufacturer of the ready mix. Mm -hmm. Please note that site mix, as uh, normally uh, called, is when they actually have got a plant on site. Mm -hmm. And then the user of the concrete is then the same as the manufacturer of the concrete. We can actually put a ready mix plant on site. This would then be handled by a different producer of the concrete, but then used on one specific site. This can also be ready mix concrete. Okay, and so what are the advantages of using ready mix over mixing it on site? I think that uh, a ready mix concrete has, uh, has got a lot of quality advantages, mm -hmm. specifically over site batching. Mm -hmm. If we look at uh, just the aggregates, when we use a ready mix plant, the ready mix plant would generally have a history of how the aggregates perform in concrete. Mm -hmm. This is important from a quality point of view because the input characteristics of your aggregate is also going to determine the concrete that you get in the end. The second thing would be pricing. I think that there's a misconception that ready mix is expensive. Mm -hmm. And if you price concrete correctly, you will find that ready mix is actually not that expensive. Mm -hmm. You have to specifically look at what you get from ready mix and then price the site mix in exactly the same way. Just the general uh, things that you need to look at when pricing is a look at the manpower needed for the production of the concrete. You will have plant needed to produce the concrete as well. There's of course a transport element to it. There is a health and safety uh, element, and then of course quality control. Mm -hmm. And if you price all of these things into the concrete on site, you will find that ready mix is a very competitive material. And when it comes to the specific applications of ready mix, is it able? To, are you able to get a ready mix that is specifically designed for your application that you want? Yes, of course. Uh, we generally, as concrete technologists, say that. Uh, uh, we can make miracles happen in an hour, but the impossible takes us 24 hours. So you can make concrete for any application. We can make wonderful uh, concretes these days to fill any uh, type of structure and for specific use. As a matter of fact, the specification SANS 878 mm -hmm. makes, makes specific mention of fit for purpose concrete in accordance to specifications. Mm -hmm. Now fit for purpose concrete, we can make it so that it fits your specific application. I think the most important thing when it comes to ready mix is that there should be communication between the ready mix supplier and the client and the actual user of the concrete. Remember that sometimes the client is not the person that does the concrete work and the people that actually do the concrete work should be able to specify what the concrete is like. Once that communication is up and running, then you will find that on site you will get concrete that can be used first time and doing it right the first time. So then when it comes to producing ready mix and using it on site, what are some of the problems that can creep in there that people should keep an eye out for? With ready mix concrete, generally we have a good quality control. Mm -hmm. That means that when the concrete comes to site, then the concrete is already guaranteed, and that is especially true for SARMA members. Unfortunately, most of the problems that I have seen occurs in the use of the concrete. Now, just one of those examples would be the consolidation of the concrete. That's the vibration that we do with the concrete in order to get the air out. Now, only 1% of air can make a 6% difference in the strength of the concrete. So you can imagine if you leave 5% air in the concrete, then you lose 25 to 30% of the strength of the concrete. Mm -hmm. Now that factor comes down to the consolidation, the vibration of the concrete. If you don't take the air out, then the concrete might be of a lower strength. 
Now, that is a factor which we cannot control from a ready mix manufacturer point of view. That must be controlled on site. The second thing, for instance, are cracking. Now, cracking can be easily avoided uh, if you follow the right steps, but the cracks in concrete is generally not put in by the ready mix supplier. Those cracks is due to environmental factors and the use of the concrete itself. Unfortunately, those, uh, shall I say, mistakes made then reflects bad on the ready mix supplier. And it, naturally, the ready mix supplier gets blamed for that. Again, I'm going to come back to communication. The user of the concrete and the ready mix supplier should be communicating effectively. That way, the ready mix supplier can advise and can instruct the user of the concrete on how to use this high tech product. And does SOMA play a role in, in educating people about the, the proper application of ready mix and ensuring that they get it right on site? Of course. That is out of one of our mandates from our ready mix uh, members. Uh, of course, the better that the concrete is being used, the better it reflects on the ready mix uh, uh, suppliers in general. So yes, we've got several courses that, uh, that we present. One of them is the ready mix workshop. It is called the Ready Mix Workshop and it is also CPD accredited. Now this Ready Mix Workshop deals with the handling of concrete, the ordering of concrete, specification of concrete and it's open to a very wide audience from specifiers all the way down to site personnel. It also handles the testing of concrete and remember that we make all our decisions on the testing of concrete mm. and the acceptance criteria comes down to the testing. So it's important for us to teach the users of concrete how to test effectively and how to use our concrete effectively. Also, we work together with the other concrete industry associations in bringing knowledge to the users of concrete. Uh, so I would take it then it's, it's important to have a, a good ready mix supplier. So how do companies go about selecting a supplier that is going to provide them with a good quality ready mix? Danielle, you have to ask the right questions. I think that is the bottom line. Of course, I would like to tell everybody that the SARMA members are being accredited ready mix suppliers. They get audited twice a year and uh, it is a, an independent audit that we conduct on those plants. But please remember that any ready mix supplier can be reputable, but you have to ask them the right questions. As a user of concrete, you're allowed to visit the plant you're allowed to ask for their mix designs and you're allowed to look at the history of the aggregates and to look at the training level of the staff. If you are not happy with concrete, you are welcome to send that concrete back from site. But from Salma's point of view, we educate our members, we educate the users of concrete. In order to select the right ready mix supplier, a reputable, accredited ready mix supplier, First and foremost, ask for a SARMA accreditation certificate. Should you don't, do not get one, then ask the right questions and SARMA is here to help for you to select a reputable ready mix supplier. Please be aware, and this is not something easily said, but there are so-called cowboys out there. So please make sure that you ask the right questions and select a reputable accredited ready mix supplier. And does SARMA get involved well, I suppose it would play more part if it was one of your members. If somebody was unhappy with the quality that they received from a SARMA member, does the association get involved there to help deal with that issue? Yes, of course. First and foremost, SARMA is here for the users of concrete. Mm -hmm. So whether it is a SARMA member or a non-SARMA member, uh, we would certainly help protect the reputation of the ready mix industry. And we are here to help with, uh, with questions, with investigations. As a matter of fact, we've got reputable concrete technologists that are helping us look at specific problems that we have got. You're welcome to contact the SA Ready Mix Association for help should you have any problems with Ready Mix. Of course, we, uh, we prefer to work with the SARMA members and that is uh, one of the special uh, additions to our membership that SARMA members also qualify for a bespoke insurance scheme only for SARMA accredited members mm. which should give some peace of mind to the users of concrete. But to answer your question, yes, SARMA is here for the users of ReadyMix Concrete. Okay. 
You spoke earlier about testing and the importance of testing the concrete. So what goes into testing you know, your concrete to ensure that it is up to spec? It is very important to realize that there's two different types of testing that we do and uh, which are which and secondly which can be submitted either to an engineer or a contractor for acceptance control. The first one is process control testing. Now process control testing is what happens on the ready mix plant. This is used to determine the quality of the concrete that we send out firstly and secondly also to determine how well the plant is running. We also design our concrete on the standard deviation of the plant and that standard deviation comes from a statistical analysis of the testing that we do on the plant itself. Now this testing is not generally, unless it is agreed upon, available to the engineer for quality control and acceptance of the concrete. The second type of testing is we do quality control testing. This is the testing that happens on site and that gets sampled according to the standards and gets tested strictly according to the SA national standards. This is then also tested through a laboratory that is accredited for those specific tests and these tests are admissible to the engineer and to the contractor and of course the client then as acceptance control of the concrete. Generally the first test that is done is the slump test that is to accept the concrete before casting starts and secondly we then do compressive strength testing. Most of the other tests like a tensile splitting test or shrinkage testing that is done beforehand as a control in order to see that the mixture is going to be fit for purpose and fit for the application that it is needed for. Okay, and the slump test, um, you're going to perform one of those for us just now to have a look at, but can you walk us through you know, the slump test, how it's performed, what you should be looking out for? Yes, of course. The slump test is probably one of the most important tests for us as ReadyMix suppliers. That is because the first part of the acceptance of the concrete happens through the slump test. Please note that sampling is probably the most important point when doing any testing and especially the slump test. Sampling has to happen from a moving stream of concrete from the chute or the back of the ready mix truck. Sampling also happens after the truck has been mixed for five minutes. This is a very important point. Mixing the truck for five minutes makes sure that there is no segregation in the truck and that the concrete that you discharge in the beginning to do the slump test on is not segregated concrete and is representative of the whole sample in the concrete truck. The second point would be then to remix the concrete in a wheelbarrow and then you will see from the slump test that we will conduct now that um, the steps taken to do a slump test. Then important is to know what the result of the slump test actually means. Mm. Remember that the slump test, you can get a slump value. These values, according to SANS 878, is, uh, has to be used in accordance to specific tolerances. Mm. Just as an example, for a 90 millimeter slump, the tolerance is 25 millimeters up or down. Mm. That means that when concrete comes to site, and is tested within the first half an hour of the truck arriving on site, then anything from 65 millimeters to 115 millimeters has to be accepted according to those tolerances. Unfortunately, concrete is a variable product and we cannot do slums perfectly every single time. Mm. So those tolerances are being put in place. Should you wish to have a different tolerance number one, or number two, a specific type of slump, then you need to communicate with the ready mix supplier. My recommendation to specifiers would be to specify a range of slump. So if you are going to uh, specify a 90 millimeter, for example, then decide what is the lowest that the slump can be. Generally, that would be about 80 millimeters. And then also decide on an upper limit, of course, within the tolerances, and specify a slump, for instance, if you need a 90, specify an 80 to 115 millimeters. 
that way you include the tolerance and you get the concrete that you need. It's also important to remember that you need to assess the workability of the concrete. Now slump is not an assessment of workability, you need to actually tap the base plate and the workability you need to visually assess. If I may show an example of two slumps that has got exactly the same slump value but you can clearly see that there's a difference in the workability of these two slumps. With uh, the one have moved down, there's more cohesiveness on this one, there's less cohesiveness on the right hand side. These are all the type of assessments that you need to make with concrete whilst doing the slump, not only simply measuring the slump itself. When starting the slump test, please note that the base plate should be on firm level ground. Secondly, the base plate as well as the slump cone is white with a wet cloth. The next step is to place your feet firmly onto the legs on the side of the slump cone and then the slump cone is filled in three 100 millimeter layers. Each layer is, is tapped 25 times exactly and then we will go on and fill it up to the next layer. When tapping the next layer, you will use the slump rod and only ingress into the previous layer. As you can see from the slump rod right here, is that the slump rod will never be dirty more than about 150 millimeters. When filling for the third layer, please note that the slump cone is overfull before you start the last 25 taps. Should the concrete move to below the slump cone when doing the top layer, please note that you stop the tapping, hold count, refill the, the slump cone and then continue tapping up to 25 taps. Next is that uh, we'll take off the top bit of concrete and the top level of the slump cone is then rolled off. Next order of business would be to clean the sides of the slump cone and to clean around the bottom to give the concrete enough space to slump down. The technician will now transfer his weight onto the hand pegs, remove his feet and pick up the slump cone in 5 seconds vertically upwards. The slump cone is then inverted. The slump rod is placed over the top of the slump cone. Slump is then measured from the highest point of the concrete slump to the bottom of the slump rod. This value is recorded to the nearest five millimeters. Also remember that there is more to a slump test than just the value. From the slump test, you can also assess workability and the cohesiveness of the concrete. We do that by tapping the base plate as follows. While we tap the base plate, observe how the concrete moves. You can see that the top ring stays intact and the bottom part of the concrete is going to become progressively larger. As we tap it, we can then assess the cohesiveness. Cohesiveness would be how the concrete basically sticks together. And you can also see from how quickly the concrete then moves down as what the compatibility of the concrete is as well. Should you need to also look at the finishability of the concrete, it's easy enough to just work off the top of the concrete to see how easy it would finish. 
and then also observe the bleeding water that you see onto the concrete which will give you an indication of how quickly and how severe the bleed of the concrete might be. The easiest way to assess the rate of bleeding would be to make a small reservoir in the concrete and then observe how water accumulates at the bottom of that reservoir. What you see here is what is a so-called shear slump. Note that the aggregate has fallen onto the side of the slump here and only part of the slump has actually gone down. You can also see the one part sticking up on the right hand side. It is important to note, to note that when a shear slump occurs that you do not measure a slump from this test but that you repeat the test. That means that this concrete has got to go back into the mixer, you have got to remix the sample and then do another, another slump. Should the slump then shear again, it's important to note that you have to record it as a shear slump and not as a value. This situation on the other hand is called a collapse slump. Note how the stone has fallen off around the side. The slump is actually not slumped into the base. This type of slump is also not measured. Should a collapse slump occur, you will take the concrete, put it back into the mixer, remix it and repeat the test. If the slump then again collapses, you will record collapse slump and not a slump value. Okay, and when people are performing the slump test, are there things that they commonly get wrong or commonly miss? Yes, generally, the, uh, I think the, the start is again, is sampling. Yes. Sampling needs to be correct. And if I can repeat that, sampling needs to happen from a moving stream of concrete. And if I can say it another way, the one thing that they do get wrong sometimes is that that means that sampling cannot happen from when the concrete is already discharged and lying on the ground or in the structure. It needs to actually be sampled from the shoot of the ready mix strap. I think the second thing is, remember that slump apparatus is also sensitive. So do keep them clean, do keep them vibration free when you put the slump base down. Then tap exactly 25 times. There's no 24, no 26. And then secondly, you measure the slump to the closest five millimeters. Mm. And then of course, keep within the tolerances. Then very important, when it does, when it does come to a shear slump or a collapse slump, this is a common misconception that you don't measure a shear slump or a collapse slump. You have to actually record, after you've repeated the test, should it still shear or collapse, you record that it's a shear or a collapse slump. Remember what the message is that you are giving back to the concrete supplier and to the concrete technologist. Should you measure an actual shear slump, you are giving him the message that the concrete is cohesive enough and that it is workable enough and that it actually achieved a slump. Now, of course, this is the wrong information because the concrete technologist needs to know that the concrete needs to be changed to be more cohesive yeah. So if you, rec if you then record a shear slump, then he knows that he will have to change the mix in order to make it more cohesive. And of course it's exactly the same with a collapse slump. Uh, Johan, there's now an increasing emphasis being placed on going green, being more environmentally friendly. So where does ReadyMix fit into that picture? Daniel, I'm glad you asked that. Mm -hmm. First and foremost on a ReadyMix plant, we recycle the water. Mm -hmm. Remember that it is illegal environmental law says that it's illegal for any cement laden water to leave the plant. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we store the washout water and we use it back into the concrete. Of course that water has to be tested and it's got certain advantages with regards to the strength mm -hmm. of the concrete for us. Any hardened concrete that gets returned to the site gets crushed down and we use that crushed down concrete back into the aggregate. Of course we test those as well and we use certain rates of replacement back into the aggregate. And then thirdly, we actively these days use more extenders in our ReadyMix concrete. Mm -hmm. With the technology of, of ReadyMix concrete having vastly improved, we are able to extend the concrete with, the, with fly ashes and with slags at very high rates these days. Now remember that those products are byproducts of industry and what we do is we put it in the concrete and 
it makes our concrete much more environmentally friendly. Fantastic. And now, concrete has been described as a high-tech product with low-tech applications. Can you elaborate a bit on that? Give us some insight. Yes, uh, concrete surely, and ready-mix concrete specifically, mm -hmm. is a very high-tech product. If you look at what it is that we put into concrete these days, you'll find that um, the types of chemicals that we put in, the advances in cement technology itself, the way that we test the concrete has increased vastly over the last few years. I can go as far as to say that ready-mix concrete has outgrown most of us and that we're just trying to keep up with it. Okay. But yes, a concrete mix design is, uh, is very high-tech these days. Uh, we add specific chemicals to it, those chemicals to uh, extend the concrete, to give us that fit-for-purpose concrete. Those chemicals cannot be used unless you know exactly what it is that you do. That is why, uh, from an accreditation point of view, you need to have an advanced concrete technologist on each of the plants for, uh, for the concrete to be designed, to be tested and uh, to be moved onto site. Now this high-tech product is generally when it comes to site is used by unskilled labor. They are the people that work on site and the, of course the concrete needs to be fit for purpose for them. It's normally manual labor as well and so the application would be a low-tech application you don't need to know anything about concrete itself and concrete technology in order to use concrete. You simply know how to need to know how to use the concrete itself. So hence, high-tech concrete, the way that we design it, the chemicals, the cements that we add these days, and then unskilled labor actually using the concrete in the end and working with it. And you know, with these advancements in concrete technology, I mean, we've got high-performance concrete now. So tell us a bit about what that is, what are its applications, some of the advantages. Well, high-performance concrete is a general term for not normal concrete. Mm -hmm. Please note that high-performance concrete is not necessarily high-strength concrete. We can have a very low-strength concrete, which can still be high-performance. As an example, if we use a no-fines concrete that is used to drain water away in, in substrates under floors, you'll find that that can also be a high-performance concrete. High-performance concrete is something that is designed specifically for an application. Yes, we do have the very high-performance concretes like the self-compacting concretes, the self-leveling concretes, durability concretes, uh, sulfite-resistant concretes. Now, those concretes are, are very high-performance concretes. But, if I could repeat that, remember that high-performance concrete is not necessarily high-strength concrete. Secondly, high-performance concrete is even more fit for purpose than normal concrete. Mm -hmm. Where normal concrete would uh, be used in a wide range of applications and generally work for all of those applications, high-performance concrete are manufactured specifically for each and every application thereof. So the slump test is kind of the first test that you would use before laying the concrete and thereafter you go into the compression test. Can you run us through the compression test, what's involved in that? Yes, of course. Of course, the compression test is also done on the same sample that the slump test would be done on. Now the compression test uh, generally, not generally, but what we, as a matter of fact, we make concrete cubes from that. Mm -hmm. Those cubes are being put in a compression machine and then we test the resistance of that concrete to the compression. It's important to note that, again, sampling is one of the most important things when it does come to testing and, of course, for the compression test as well. Then, the making of the cubes. Cubes have to be made to very strict tolerances. The tolerances are set out in the SA National Standard and each cube has to be measured before it gets tested. The second thing is the curing of those cubes. Mm -hmm. It's important that the cubes, after 24 hours in a cube mold, go into a curing tank. That curing tank has to be maintained at a temperature of 22 to 25 degrees centigrade in the water. The water needs to be stirred, the cubes needs to be fully submerged, and you've got to actually measure that temperature twice a day and record that that temperature stays between 22 and 25. We then test compressive tests on seven days and 28 days. Remember that three cubes constitute one test. 
on seven days, we can clearly see if the concrete is going to go the right direction and we can make some assumptions with regards to the strength of the concrete on 28 days. The 28 day test then confirms the strength of the concrete for final acceptance of the concrete in the structure. Again, sampling is one of the most important things. Make sure that the sample that the cubes are being made of is a representative sample of the concrete that was in the ReadyMix truck. And if that process is not followed correctly, what are the, the implications? I think there is no test that uh, you can test concrete with that will give you a higher strength than what the concrete actually is. Mm -hmm. So any failure to make the cubes correctly or to test them correctly or a slow testing rate or a different testing rate from the SA National Standard will give you a lower strength cube. Now, I specifically say a lower strength cube because in this instance, the test is actually the failure. Mm -hmm. If you don't do it correctly, the cube will test at a lower strength and it will seem like the concrete on site has got a lower strength and this is not always true. That is why as concrete technologists we investigate the testing first and foremost should we pick up a failure of concrete. It's important to know that any test and a failure to test correctly is going to give you a lower strength and this does not follow through to the concrete on site. Thank you. And when it comes to the, the applications of ReadyMix and where it can be used, is this limited to certain applications? Of course not. We can do anything in a ReadyMix truck. As a matter of fact, we, uh, we do things like self-compacting concretes. Now, self-compacting concretes is exactly what the word says. It does not need any vibration to expel air. Uh, it fills molds literally like water would fill a mold. All the way down to making normal concretes and as far as to making even plasters and mortars in a ReadyMix truck. Mm -hmm. Now, did you know that we can make plaster in a ReadyMix truck that when it is supplied to site, you can put it in a container and it can stay fresh for up to a week. Once the concrete is then removed from that container and put between bricks or onto a wall, that concrete will then continue to reach its strength. So all of this is achieved through adding certain chemicals to our concrete. Also, we've got, uh, for instance, fiber reinforced concrete these days, microfiber reinforced concrete to mitigate uh, some cracking, and then even structural fibers. Those structural fibers can go as far as to replacing the reinforcement steel in some of our structures, and all of this can be put into a ready mix truck. Well, Johan, thank you so much for your time and for your insights. This has been Daniel Peterson for CPD On Demand.